and queen. When people grin from ear to ear, scream with joy, and can't help but dance, no matter what age they are, then the reason for that might just be ABBA. ABBA, uh, they're great. I love ABBA. Brilliant band. <laughs> My mom's favorite. Very, very good. These days, um, you, you don't find very many who actually dislike ABBA but you, you find a lot of people who kind of like ABBA and a lot of people who really do. It's an amazing phenomenon. Everyone loves ABBA, their music, and their style. No one, it seems, actually hates them, something a lot of musicians can only dream of. So how did the four likable Swedes do it? Let's find out. Where does the band stand today, after their reunion and sold-out concerts in London? The social media generation loves ABBA. The band's own TikTok channel, featuring videos from the past and present, has more than two million followers, which isn't bad. But the hashtag ABBA alone has billions of views. ABBA is among the bands whose songs are most often covered by others. Oh, yeah. YouTube features countless cover versions of their songs in every genre imaginable. Each generation spawns new ABBA fans. So what's behind the band's enduring appeal? The sound, I guess, especially the two girls' voices. And maybe that's what appeals, but it's very difficult to say. It's, it's really, it's for other people to try and explain that. Challenge accepted, Bjorn. We spoke to a music journalist, an opera singer, a former Eurovision winner, a fashion designer, songwriters, composers, and producers. All of them know ABBA personally and live in Stockholm. The two couples behind ABBA, Benny and Anifried, Agneta and Björn, were not always as well-loved as they are today. In the beginning, a lot of journalists and fellow musicians thought the band was totally uncool. Back in the 70s, in Sweden, ABBA was a no-go. You should definitely not listen to ABBA, you shouldn't praise them. They were always neglected by the media. Well, the media treated them, uh, I would say, in the beginning especially, very badly. Because they were so commercial, in their sense, they wanted to be, they wanted to be world famous. Politics and anti-war and, you know, you're not supposed to make money. And You know, the, the moose, you know, and in, in some farmland, you know, where you're supposed to be genuine and all that stuff. So, yeah, so ABBA, like, they were in their, they were in their writing room on their island. The two male members of ABBA who wrote all the songs were seen as being a bit too business savvy. And then there was their stage wear, a combination of glam rock, folklore, and disco. You can still buy some of these classic outfits, but only in costume shops. Which only goes to prove how recognizable the ABBA look is. I think they all were a little bit too much, actually, but um, it was not sexy and it was not cool, it was fun. <laughs> this is so crazy. Yeah, it's iconic. While 1970s rock stars gained infamy for trashing hotel rooms in a drunken rampage, the members of ABBA had a squeaky clean, family-friendly image. Married, well-behaved, harmless, scandal-free. 
But while some mocked them for that, their concerts, like here in London, were attended by some very famous fans. ABBA's songs apparently had something that appealed to their hipper rock star colleagues. No one really saw what happened back at uh, Wembley Stadium in London in 1978. Uh, backstage was Joe Strummer from The Clash, who was a big ABBA admirer, and uh, Bruce Springsteen uh, was also a big fan of ABBA. Lots of people understood very, like, that this is like masterful pop music. Do you have people like Elvis Costello and other pop writers going like, we've always respected ABBA, but we couldn't say so. When they were, 20, when they were 22, like Elvis Costello was, he couldn't come out in the press and go like, yeah, I've been listening to you know, Super Trooper like all day. You know, that wouldn't really work, <laughs> but, but they were. That's no longer a problem. Even Dave Grohl has described his band Foo Fighters as a cross between a punk rock band and ABBA. They love ABBA. But actually, ABBA's coolness transformation didn't start until 10 years after they broke up. And it was the gay club scene that celebrated their campiness and helped usher in a revival of ABBA's music. In the 1994 Australian film The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, ABBA's joyful kitsch is raised to a new level. It becomes a key to personal freedom. Their most loyal fan base is the gay scene, definitely. And I think that's the, the way ABBA has created their music, this typical happy sad, is something that is a part of like gay culture in, in, in a larger pers perspective. And of course, all the kitsch uh, costumes. So, so the gay scene is extremely impor important for uh, the life of ABBA. Just as important was the film Muriel's Wedding, also from 1994 and also from Australia, the country with the most loyal ABBA fans next to Germany. Here too, the band itself never appears. Dancing to a soundtrack of the still uncool music of ABBA, a pair of social outcasts turn out to be the true winners. Suddenly, everything ABBA had been criticized for became reasons to love them. But none of that would have been possible without their pop perfection. ABBA did nothing by halves. They worked with only the very best musicians and from the start wanted the fullest sound. Four guitars instead of two, two drum kits instead of one. More of a small orchestra than just a band. Songs like Waterloo, and Dancing Queen wouldn't have been possible without the wall of sound technique. ABBA didn't invent it, but they did make it their own. You listen to those production ideas and go like, why is everything so clear even though I know that you know, there are two or three different keyboards and there's a marimba and there's this big piano underneath and there's this wall of Frida and Agnetha. It's like, why does it still sound so clean? You know, as opposed to just being like this mess of glop, even though it's like lots and lots of things, they thought it through. It's always an introduction, a verse. Then the other story is different. Because there's the, the middle eight, there's the extra verse, you sing a chorus and then there's a little extra thing onto it. This is... <laughs> Typical things for an ABBA song is usually, for me, it's the melancholy. It's, it's, they're both sad and happy at the same time. Pretty much all of them. Uh, and I think it's in the music and it's playful. The songs are very playful. And they're very clear. And if the staccatos in the songs are very, you know, it's very ABBA. You know, it's sort of classics meets uh, something else. But I think ABBA is inspired by classical music from the beginning. Slow. 
slipping through my fingers. Slipping through my fingers. It could be uh, Tchaikovsky, it could be uh, Schubert, Schumann, it could be Brahms. I mean, it's, it's these wonderful melodies. It makes me cry every time I hear it. <laughs> They've sold hundreds of millions of albums and released more than a hundred tracks, a mere fraction of the songs they wrote. Some of them give insight into the band's private lives, with Bjorn's lyrics reflecting what was happening in the two couples' marriages. They were very Swedish, in a way. The songs were about their life. Uh, we followed them into the success, into their marriages into the divorce and to the sudden end. Dealing with the end of his marriage and the possible end of his band, Bjorn poured his sadness and disappointment into lyrics for his ex-wife, Agneta, to sing, becoming her favorite song. Few songs have taken such a melancholy look at the meaning of relationships. Writing aside, ABBA would be nothing without the voices of the two singers. Not only does each have an impressive vocal range, but they also harmonize perfectly. Every now and then in, in the history of music, voices meet up. And I think in, in the ABBA context, you know, something magical happened. If I remember correctly, uh, they also used, you know, they. Uh, speed it up, tape recorders or things like that when they recorded their voices and, and, and slow them down again and that sort of created um, the, the ABBA sound. They found you know, a third voice. Anita is very high and she still is. It's so fragile but still very, very powerful and I think that's, that's her secret. Anna Frida is the alto and she's even deeper now, her voice. I mean, the third voice is Agneta and Anna Fried combined together. Those voices singing those songs. They helped make the Swedish music scene world famous. Sweden is one of the most successful uh, pop exporting countries in the whole wide world. And ABBA was definitely the ones who kicked it all off when they uh, had their big breakthrough in 1974 at the Eurovision, which uh, followed with Roxet and uh, Ace of Base and uh, Cardigans and uh, Mandu Diao. But ABBA was the first uh, act from a non-English country who made it really big. <laughs> Bjorn and Benny setting a tone for uh, writing. Well, whether people want to acknowledge it or not, it is that, it's that Mozart of the songwriting here. There's that foundation. Restoring a theater in Stockholm and, and owning them and, and trying to get, keep the music scene alive uh, and, and, and help the music industry or musical industry or by doing productions and, and producing things and I think by keeping their own brand alive they're also at the same time working on helping yeah, Swedish music industry in general I think. ABBA certainly is very enterprising. They may have seemed unassuming back in 1972 in one of their first TV appearances, but behind that was an unwavering commitment to marketing. When new mother Agneta skipped a German TV appearance to stay with her baby, the show had to go on. Her friend Inga Brunden took her place, hiding behind her hair and looking less than comfortable. But no one would notice, right? But seriously, it was their videos that were truly innovative, especially for the 1970s, nearly a decade before MTV revolutionized the format. These days, some of their videos have been watched hundreds of millions of times on YouTube. They wanted to be stars, and they really you know, try to project 
you know, the music and the stardom and the, the clothes and the, they took pictures, lots of pictures, so many pictures. If you look at the ABBA Museum, I mean, they t I mean, I, I can't believe it how many pictures they took all the time. I mean, it looks like they didn't do anything else than take pictures. After both couples divorced, the band decided to call it quits in 1982. But every few years, they managed to land a few coups without ever taking the stage. In 1992, they released a greatest hits album, ABBA Gold. British pop duo Erasure released an album of ABBA covers. And it was clear, ABBA was essential for any party. But Bjorn and Benny sensed there was more to be gained. No things started to happen in the 90s. The word changed its eye to ABBA, and ABBA themselves believed that we have something, <laughs> we, 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 can, we can go on. So that's very important, what happened when they were a non-existing band at the time. And since it was all going so well, and Bjorn and Benny had been successful with other musicals, it was a no-brainer to create Mamma Mia! The Musical. The production premiered in London on April 6, 1999. I think even the critics must have liked it. They kept sort of evolving and kept thinking, how can we do more of that? And how can we? And I think they made more money from Mamma Mia the Musical than they have from the from the from the records they've sold. Mamma Mia was such a success that Hollywood came calling. The film version premiered in 2008 and featured Meryl Streep and Pierce Brosnan singing. ABBA's songs carried the stars through the film with a lightheartedness that enchanted a global audience. The Swedish mentality is really fantastic because we don't care about famous people. When they did uh, um, Mamma Mia, uh, the film, uh, with Meryl Streep and all these big stars. I realized that Meryl Streep was actually more starstruck <laughs> than ABBA themselves. The inevitable sequel followed a decade later, launching ABBA's old hits back into the charts. In the meantime, the band had another plan to enshrine their legendary status, a monument to themselves. It kicked off in 2008 with the traveling exhibition ABBA World, featuring memorabilia and an early version of today's avatars, which fans could join on stage. Then, on May 7, 2013, ABBA the Museum opened its doors to the public in the Swedish capital, Stockholm. And once again, the band gained new young fans. Tourists now come from around the world to visit the museum. They've been very thinking about it in a business manner. Uh, I think mostly uh, Bjorn is a very business-minded man. Benny is more of a all the music all the time and uh, he has his own little band he plays folk music and but he, i mean he's also part of the big musicals but uh, but bjorn i think is the more more business minded guy seeing how bjorn deals with his investments and what he does actually with innovation and with gaming and all that other stuff because he's created this world for himself and that you know the movies and everything i mean it's you know, you, you can't be more productive than that, actually. Part of that is the development of virtual reality avatars. Using motion capture recordings of singing and dancing stand-ins, as well as the original band members, the digital doppelgangers are not just museum ready, but stage ready as well. ABBA announced the release of two new songs in 2018 for concerts to be performed by the avatars. Yet another coup. There are techno artists in, in San Francisco building my head as we speak. <laughs> it all came together in an incredible comeback in September 2021 when the band recorded a new studio album together, ABBA Voyage. No one had expected it and the response was suitably sensational. A whole album called Voyage because it's been a voyage into uncharted territory. The pressure was on for the first concert in May 2022 in London. 
If it all failed, the ABBA legend would be tarnished, the purpose-built venue an expensive flop, and the avatars soulless, empty reflections. But once again, ABBA did everything right. Seeing these images, who still remembers the early versions of the avatars? It's not a game changer. It will, you know, be a, a, a milestone, I think, in, in uh, music entertainment. I think, uh, you know, I've never had such a good time as I'm having now. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm a happier man now than I was in the 70s. Whether it's songwriting, marketing, or crafting their image, it all seems to have come easy for ABBA. Yet they've always stayed grounded. In the end, ABBA stands for one thing above all, and it's perhaps the reason everyone loves them. It's the memories. When people hear ABBA, they think of their youth. I was uh, Annefried when I was young. You know, we always pick one of the girls and I was always Annefried. <laughs> I'm originally from Uganda. Between 71 to 79, Uganda was in a very uh, turmoil state. If there's anything that I can remember, it's ABBA was always on the airwaves. I don't think there's any other group that we play so much than ABBA music. And that goes for basically all the sort of top 40 stations in Sweden still. And a lot of people today go and see Mamma Mia, and I don't, I don't think, maybe they don't even know what ABBA is, you know? They think it's Mamma Mia, you know? So I think over the generations, if it's good enough, it'll, it'll come through. If everybody could write a song like ABBA, all, you know, everybody would. Now, not in the 70s, of course, because it wasn't cool. They're one of the most covered artists of all time just like the Beatles. Friday nights and the lights are low. It's a lucky twist of fate for ABBA that their Looking songs have remained so timeless. Where they play the right music, getting in the swing, you come to look for a king. Do, do, do. You are the dancing queen. Your next sweet only 17. But Bjorn himself says it best. It is the story about these four people who came together by chance. Two beautiful women with fantastic voices should meet and fall in love with two guys who happen to be songwriters and that they should form a group and that their music would live on. I mean, what are the odds against that? That's a wonderful story. That's it. Even though everyone loves ABBA, the four have decided that the final chapter of the band's story has been written. But what do you think? Will they pull another rabbit out of the hat? Release a new album or at least a new song? What would you like to see ABBA do next? Hi.